Hello to chapter 100 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville and this chapter is titled Leg and Arm. The Peacock of Nantucket meets the Samuel Enderby of London. Ship ahoy! Hast seen the white whale? So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colours bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter deck, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of sixty or thereabouts dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot cloth and one empty arm of his jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. Hast seen the whale? See you this? And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm whale bone terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. Man my boat! cried Ahab impetuously and tossing about the oars near him. Stand by to lower. In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment, Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg, he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own, and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the peacock, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now, it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it, like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea. For the great swells now lift the boat high up towards the bulwarks and then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So, deprived of one leg and the strange ship, of course being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab, and in the present instance all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship leaning over the side by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes. For at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out, I see, I see. A vast heaving there. Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle. As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft, and the massive curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who at once, comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook. It was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree, and then, giving the word, held himself fast, and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head, with his ivory arm frankly thrust forth in welcome, the other captain advanced and Ahab putting out his ivory leg 
and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east and taking a rueful sight along it as if, had, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the course of it at least, and that leg too. Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? It was the first time in my life that I ever cruised on the line, began the Englishman. I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. Well, one day we lowered for a pot of four or five whales, and my boat fastened to one of them. A regular circus horse he was, too, that went mil milling and milling round so that my boat's crew could only trim dish by sitting all their sterns on the outer gunwale. Presently, up breaches from the bottom of the sea, a bouncing great whale with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he, it was he, cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath and harpoon sticking in near his starboard fin. Ay, ay, they were mine, my irons, cried Ahab exultingly. But on! Well, give me a chance, then, said the Englishman good-humouredly. Well, this old great-grandfather with the white head and hump runs all of foam into the pod and goes to snapping furiously at my fast line. Ay, I see, wanted to part it, free the fast fish, an old trick, I know him. How it was exactly, continued the one-armed commander, I do not know, but in biting the line it got foul of his teeth, caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, so that when we afterwards pulled on the line, Bounce! We came plump on his hump instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking. Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, I resolved to capture him, spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in, and thinking the haphazard line would get loose or the tooth it was tangled to might draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a Paul on a whale line. Seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat, Mr. Mounttop's here. By the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mounttop, the Captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mounttop's boat, which, you see, was gunwale and gunwale with mine then, and snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But Lord, look you, sir, hearts and souls alive, man, the next instant. In a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight out of it, perpendicular in the air like a marble steeple. No use turning all, then. But as I was groping at midday, with a blinding sun, all crown jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second iron to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a Lima tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters and flukes first, the white hump backed through the wreck as though it was all chips. We all struck out to escape his terrible flailings. I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish but a combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forward, went down like a flash, and the bob of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames. I was thinking when, when all of a sudden, thank the 
Good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest. By the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship surgeon, Bunger, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunger, my boy, spin your part of the yarn. So, and I will stop now because uh, my voice simply doesn't hold for any more today. Bye-bye. Till next time with the second part of chapter 100.